Now to Assemblymember Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to pick up on, on several issues that uh, Assemblymember Garrett touched on. Uh, overall, are, are you confident that the tram network in London is safer than it was in 2016? That's to you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If, if, I, mean, I, I mean, we said earlier, technologies. I mean, a lot of the technologies now that have been incorporated, adopted, not just by Croydon, but by all tramways, they weren't being looked at before. You know, advancements, as I said, in the automotive industry and things like that. Uh, and we've gone, we've gone talking to those industries and uh, uh, producing guidance, and, and people have readily adopted that. So without question, yes. Okay. And we talked about culture a great deal, and I think culture is... It's, it's key because if your organization doesn't uh, is, has cultural faults, it, it feeds right through. But apart from culture, what has been the most significant change? Is it, is it technology or there have been, there have been other changes made? I, I think certainly from a, 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 a London Chance point of view, I think you're right, culture is part of it, uh, but technology, driving technology has, has, has been a, a huge benefit. I think um, uh, unlike heavy rail if you look at, uh, at tramway safety um, it is akin to a bus on rails uh, and so whereas uh, trains mainline trains have uh, various uh, signaling issues say safety issues etc et that didn't exist on on tramways um, we do now we, we have systems in place that will automatically stop a tram if it's going too fast we have driver inattention devices so technology has been a huge uh, uh, drive to make the, the tramway safer um, uh, but also we need to think differently about stuff you know it, how how can we influence uh, behaviors of the members of the public when they're on or around the tramway um, you know our, our highest risk at the moment is collision between car uh, and tram as highlighted by the, the lawyer reversing the other week um, or, or the guy on the uh, on the uh, on the viaduct you know so uh, it's about actually making sure that the technology is most up to date uh, and learning from other industries but also how we can influence other people around the tramway to act in a way that that won't a put them in a position of danger but also make our job slightly easier in, in being able to operate a, a safer service yeah and and with with that are, are there what are the most significant challenges to implementing those changes the changes that we've had in terms of technology. Yeah. I think a lot of it is uh, retrofitting to older vehicles. Uh, so uh, it's a lot easier to uh, install um, uh, speed controls or driver inattention devices or, or laminated glass, for instance, to new vehicles. Uh, and so we touched on our, our work that we're looking at a new fleet. We're making sure that all of the prevailing um, uh, guidance notes that Carl and his team have, have produced uh, will be applied to those trams and it's a lot easier to to fit that kind of stuff as you're building it it was a significant effort to retrofit the automatic speed control to the existing fleet um, so I think technology is easier when you build it in from the start uh, and so that's a big constraint um, in terms of other bits and pieces actually I think it, it, it's we talked about the culture of how we operate I think changing the safety messaging to, to passengers and non-use of the network arguably is also, also cultural but in another way uh, and you know so for instance one of our biggest hazards at the moment is uh, uh, members of the public um, that have got big headphones on and watching Love Island on their phone or whatever the, the current program is uh, wandering out in, into the path of a, of a tram and yeah. uh, and um, you know those of you that have been at the front of a tram around George Street and Church Street it can scare the living daylights out of you when you see people completely oblivious to a 30 ton tram coming their way so I think we can fit technology to, to, to trams to make them safer but also we've got to put a, an education program out there as well to make people understand that actually an argument between you and a 30 ton tram normally only ends in one winner hmm. Carl I've got great uh, yeah if I could just come on what Mark said I think for the first time in my memory, and I'd like to say I go back a, a few years now in this sector, we've spent uh, quite a large amount of money this year at LRSSB uh, studying pedestrian movements and passenger movements on all seven systems in the country. Uh, we have an enormous amount of video footage and data. We've done uh, escorted trips with different organisations and, and sectors of the, the community and society. Uh, it, with the 
goal of producing essentially what we call a national safety campaign, which I don't think has ever been done before, not in my time, I can't recall it. We focused very much on this in the very early days when we built Manchester and Sheffield because we we're, were essentially scared to death. We were going to put these railway vehicles on the streets of Manchester and Sheffield. I hadn't got a clue how it was going to work out, actually. I was there, you know, I remember it. And so uh, it was uh, one of the challenges, again, put to us by the ORR is, OK, you're looking at technology card, you've done some great work there, as have the cities. How do we look to help the human being now? How do we help the human better understand what their actions may result in? So we, we, we have this phenomenal, like I say, tome of work we have now to put into a, some form of campaign that we will roll out to all our, our members and colleagues within the sector. Uh, we have a number of videos out there. We've, we've gone deliberately on the sort of cartoony video in, in our style rather than pick a Croydon tram or pick a Manchester tram or because I think that's too specific. We've got this sort of uh, LRSSB type look thing and it doesn't sort of... He doesn't point anybody out, shall we say. This is just about general safety, and we're looking to develop that further. It's been, it's been a massive benefit in schools, that, but certain, certain owners would like us to be a bit more hard-hitting with some of the messaging, but we have to take all this into consideration with what we deliver. But that is, that is a goal of ours for this year's business planning. Just yeah. Okay. That's, to James, did you want to come in there, or were you just agreeing? With everything that was being said, okay, and that's it's it's good it's good team sport. Um, and, and looking at all of you, you all seem to be agreeing with pretty much everyone. Uh, all, what all of your colleagues are saying. I'm just so so in 2020, this committee um, <coughs> called for a tram safety standard. Um, how, how have stakeholders been contributing to the overall tram strategy? Do you think, what was the question? Of Trump? Do you want me to start, yeah, Carl, and yeah, come in? So, uh, so you, can, you can agree with each other. Yeah. <laughs> you can just nod along. And then, well, well, what yeah. I would say, uh, and I have forgot to mention this as well, is I'm actually, I actually sit on the board of LOSSB, so I regularly hold Carl yeah. to account, uh, as, as, as he will attest. Um, so I think um, prior to LOSSB's um, uh, uh, invention, if you like, there was a document which was called the Tramways Principles and Guidance Document. Uh, and if you're having trouble sleeping at night, put that by the side of your bed and, uh, and have a look at that. It will work. But essentially what that contained uh, is all of the, the, the uh, standards which you should look to, to have when, you're, when you're, you're constructing a new system, uh, be that interfaces with uh, road traffic or, or, or cyclists or pedestrians and things like that. What Carl is moving away from, uh, from that is a, a number of standards that each deal with specific issues. Uh, and learnings are taken from REIB reports uh, where there's been an incident or, or other incidents on or around other tramways to make sure we can inform those guidance nodes to learn the lessons whether there's anything we can do in terms of constructability uh, and things like that. And we all, whenever we <coughs> carry out renewal works or, or, or build something new, we always take uh, account of those guidance notes that exist to make sure we are constructing things in the safest possible way, not only for our users, but also for the people that are around the networks as well. I don't know if that takes your thunder away. I couldn't, away, I couldn't have said it better myself. But uh, yeah, the TPG, uh, which previous to that was RSP2, was an, an ORR-owned, uh, let's call it, document. Uh, we now look after that. We, we if you like, secretary at that uh, stewardship for the ORR. Uh, and that has had a complete rewrite this year. Uh, the ORR have just reviewed it actually and sent it back to us as recently as a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, that is now, thankfully, because of the introduction of LRSSB, is becoming more of a signpost document now because, as Mark rightly points out, we have got now whole rafts of guidance that sits, sit off the back of that. Uh, ironically, one of the ones that we're, uh, we haven't got yet and we were looking to do and we work with Mark and his team is essentially a UK tram specification. We tend to be a bit too beholden to what Europe give us when it comes to procurement to trams, because to put it bluntly, we're very small scale in the, the worldwide global procurement market. So we're trying to help the sector with clients like TfL uh, have a bit more weight behind them, mm -hmm. say, no, 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 we, we have to have these things on our tram because this is what our safety bodies say we should have. Because at the moment we're a little bit at the, at the behest of what Europe says, 
because Europe, that's where they're manufactured in the, in the vast majority of cases. So we are looking to work with TfL and, uh, as it happens, uh, is it TI oil, in, oil in Dublin, who are looking to pure, procure a large new fleet to develop a UK tram specification. So it gives us a bit more strength with manufacturers. I think we're pushing a little bit at open doors, but I, I like to think we are, as we spoke about earlier with one of your colleagues, uh, when it comes to our own internal authorities and owners. But with Europe, we have to be a bit stronger because, unfortunately, they buy hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trams a year. You have to put it into context that German, two or three German cities have just clubbed together to sign an order for 500 vehicles for German mm -hmm. cities, and that buys an awful lot of influence when you're spending that sort of money. But we'll, we'll keep going at it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and. Uh, in 2020, this predates me, by the way, the committee also suggested there should be a review of signage in relation to trams. Has that been carried out? Uh, there's certainly a guidance note, and I assume yeah. all the tramways have, have adopted that guidance note that we do not sign tramway signage, uh, similar to egress and, f and, and fire and rescue from trams. Um, yeah, and there's, there's been guidance notes uh, put out for, for virtually all of the recommendations that came off the back of 2016, yeah. Okay. Can I just add something as well, just a point which um, Member Garrett mentioned earlier on about signage in the sensing remarks. So the, the guidance notes that, that Carl and his team produce are the minimum standard, uh, and so we are encouraged to look at more broadly beyond that standard as to what else we can put in place, um, you know, in terms of location and, and, and type of sign as well. So. Um, you know, for instance, we're looking at things around uh, uh, pedestrian crossings about can we make that signage, you know, slightly more uh, prominent or, or a different design to make it more obvious that, that people need to take advantage of that. So whilst the guidance notes that Carl and the team are producing are incredibly important, they're a minimum standard. We're encouraged to look beyond that to see what else we need to do. Okay. Yeah, James. Yeah, it's just to say, and, and that's where um, the best practice that we share within the industry, that's something that we, we, we make sure we do. So even if people are at the minimum standard, if someone comes up with something, you know, the trials that are going on with, you know, like illuminating, you know, uh, pedestrian walkways so they go red if a tram's approaching whatever that may be there's trials going on in europe and we're sharing that back with with, with our colleagues in the uk because we want to make sure that we're yeah we're at the forefront of not just it's good enough that it's you know yeah, we're, we're, we're at gold yeah. star yeah absolutely um finally on on from me um it, it, assembly member garrett also touched on fatigue but i'm just wondering is there standard guidance for fatigue that's uh, now issued yes there is there is yeah there is okay. yeah that's great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, now look to Assemblymember Desai. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, so just looking forward, uh, what future safety proposals are, are under consideration? And on top of everything you said to us this morning, is there anything else you wish to add about any other safety technology that has been implemented on London's tram uh, network? Um, so the question uh, is at all of you. Yeah, yeah, fine. So um, I think when we're talking about what future safety uh, enhancements there might be, if I can just take it back a stage insofar as how we identify what that might be. So um, uh, using the risk model, we can determine what are uh, the biggest risks are. So we'd have to think about what could we do that we don't already have to make uh, our network safer. Um, and we can look at all different bits of technology for that. So, for instance, for your other point, I was in, uh, lucky enough to be in Frankfurt earlier this year to look at obstacle detection systems that they have on their trams in that city, which uh, constantly scans uh, the road ahead uh, to determine whether there's a, an obstruction in the way that would then bring the tram to a stop. Uh, and I think Blackpool have been trialling a system in the UK similar to that. So, um, you know, we're open to looking at that kind of stuff if technology can improve there. What also we, we have is what, what is called a Joint System Safety Improvement Plan, which we've pulled together with uh, Ben and his team, looking at what our top risks are and trying to come up with ways uh, to introduce other bits and pieces to make it safer. So, for instance, uh, recently we had a new campaign uh, around pedestrian crossings where we use social media uh, we used uh, adverts on websites that were geo-targeted geo to people within, I think it was two kilometres of the tramway. So if you're looking at a website or if you're watching Love Island on your phone, uh, an ad would pop up 
which would give you uh, a specific safety uh, campaign message around about crossings um, and how you should look out for trams. So we're constantly looking about what's there. Um, I can't predict what we'll have next week because we might come up with something completely new. Yeah. But I think uh, I can give you the assurance that we are constantly looking for new and novel ways to either change the messaging we give uh, to passengers or to look at other industries to see what we can do to introduce on our network to make it safer. And Carl uh, is doing the same at LOSSB and obviously we share best practice at the UK tram groups that James referred to earlier. So uh, I think it's it's a constant moving piece, I think it's fair to say. Um, uh, and, uh, and we look to, to not only, and, and Trish may well come in on this in a second, whatever we do on London trams, we make sure we can use uh, more widely within other parts of TfL as well. Yeah, um, just to reiterate one more, said, we, we have the model that, that drives the top five or top ten risks for the sector, and then we, we have our working <coughs> groups to understand what the sector is doing, as Mark said, for uh, individually, and then we will take that under res research and development programmes to try and bring the latest innovation to the sector rather than, say, one tramway have to uh, f fund uh, some innovative technology. We will do that and then we can sort of spread the message across the, across the, the country, as it were. Chris? Yeah, I was ju just going to come in and I think kind of touching on the cultural uh, piece from earlier as well, one of the biggest differences is this kind of annual real fresh pair of eyes and, and review of the risks. So whereas before you were almost building it on top of what you already had, there was that temptation to say this is what we had last year, what do we need to change? Mm. That's <coughs> had a wholesale change and so now those three days are sat basically working from bottom up, let's review all the risks again which does lead us to be more innovative just by virtue of doing that because you're looking at new things that have come in during the year um, and then you know the, the comments on how collaborative we've all been yes we've all been agreeing with each other but actually that's because we are having these broader conversations on an ongoing basis which means that we can learn from each other but also that we've got a bit more uh, bargaining power when we want to go to the market and, and get some technology innovations <coughs> that, that it's not just for one small network actually we're looking across the country or beyond uh, to see what we can do in that space Brett. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, we, we, we've talked about lots of different things around what have come out of the accident um, in uh, St. Anne's, but it, it, for me as well, one of the, the well, as the operator, one of the biggest things that we've done with technology, which Mark's briefly skirted a little about, but we haven't really given it the recognition it, I think it deserves, which was the correct side door enabling. That's, that's a, a system that's been devised collaboratively between members of my team and Mark's team where we've now got a system on the new tram where it, if you inadvertently can't open the doors on the incorrect side, so if people are on a packed tram and the door's open on the wrong side, you, there's that risk of potentially falling out and all of the, those issues has gone and that's been successfully rolled out on that tram now for about 18 months. We're in the mid stages of implementing that onto the older tram. So again, it's using technology as a way to take away, again, the reliance on drivers always having to be the the, the one mitigation for safety barriers. So I think that's a, a good news story from us that, that has come from just working <coughs> together on that. I think that James saw. Oh. So, um, yeah. Um, 